we're in Toronto for the Flash in the Can conference, and I had the pleasure of running into John Underkoffler, chief scientist at Oblong Industries. John, most known for his work on the user interface in Minority Report and its subsequent development into a working product, gave a keynote speech here Tuesday, but we caught him earlier on a panel and grabbed him to chat about what he's up to in the future of user interfaces. Enough branching points. Uh, Dragon's Lair, anyone remember that video game? Yeah. So there's, there's just not enough branching points. What's missing is a, is a proper vehicle, a proper tool set for, for enabling you know, the, a, a richness of interaction that exceeds that threshold that we're used to from human interaction. Right? So I mean, it's the difference between being on a monorail, in which case you can choose to look out the left window or the right window, or having your own uh, jetpack, I suppose, <laughs> being able to access all of three-dimensional space. And I think we're just getting to the jetpack, to some of the jetpack moments, some of the jetpack uh, technological components and design components too, because no one really, really knows how to build these interactive experiences yet. So your background, what's your background like? Should we go from the present to the past or the other way around? Present to the past. Present to the past. So right now I'm, uh, co I'm the co-founder and, and chief scientist of Oblong Industries, which uh, I suppose in short manufacturers minority reports. We build, in real life, the gestural interface system um, that, uh, that we had earlier designed for the film Minority Report, which in turn was based on our work back at MIT, so there's a kind of virtuous full cycle circle going on. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly more than a full-time task. We are a venture-backed uh, startup with real-world clients and customers. And uh, at the moment, we have real working G-Speak systems. G-Speak is what we call uh, this gestural system, um, whose category, we say, is the spatial operating environment, sort of the operating system of the future. And we regard it as a, a kind of uh, urgent imperative that, that this system become the, the new universal human machine interface. It's kind of a necessity here at the end of times uh, when the mouse can't really keep up anymore. So our goal is that in five years or eight years, who knows how long, that every, every machine in the world, every desktop and every laptop work this way. But not just computers in that kind of familiar guise, every car dashboard, every television, every living room appliance, every kitchen appliance. Anywhere there's a screen, you should be able to point to it. Even even by, let's say, 1995, by the middle of the 90s, it, had, it seemed to me that we should be inventing a new UI. Right? Could it really be that this sort of overlapping Windows interface, that Windows with a lowercase w, you understand, uh, that this, this overlapping Windows interface that was driven by a mouse could be all that there ever was? Hopefully not. A and yet, for some historical reasons, it, it has had a uh, a durability, and that's to its credit as a kind of long-running general purpose interface. Uh, and some other distractions along the way that have kept people, I think, from returning to that work of building a new, new UI. But for me, the UI is sort of the beginning and, and the end of the thing. And that should be the nucleus, and you can grow operating systems around it, and you can grow software around it. But the UI is what exists between the human and the machine, so that has to be the, the central design task. Hmm. Um, I remember the first time I saw a ghost in the shell there's a sequence that really stuck out to me which is where they're kind of looking for some information in a database and they go to a technician that's running that database and he's got these sort of hands and a sort of neural implant and the hands each kind of shoot out little stalks and each stalk has like eight sort of micro fingers and those are the things that operate the keyboard in real sort of in like hyper motion. Yeah. And when you were talking today, you mentioned that you know you're interested in sort of symphonic gestures and, and the way that those can can run sort of machines. And whereas this sort of vision of the future was one of sort of augmenting human processes with devices. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the shift to like a more sort of I don't want to say like like choreographable, but maybe more fluid and like mm -hmm. un sort of augmented uh, gestural sort of interface view of things versus like a merely like robotic augmented view. Well, I think I think your Ghost in the Shell example is actually really interesting because, to my way of thinking, it's exactly the same 
thing um, as what I'm after. It's just a matter of where you where you draw the the concentric spheres, you know, with which radius. So um, in Ghost in the Shell, you know, there's the kind of visual metaphor of the extension of, of the human's, you know, manipulatory ability. But if you think what that means, you know, there'd have to be a lot of extra stuff here that can operate, you know, the, eight, what is it, eight per finger? I think so. Right? So now you've got yeah, 40 eight, appendages, yeah. right, yeah. that you've got to deal with. So in order to operate those, you have to have a mental model of the new kind of keyboard or the new information access or whatever it is. You mentioned also, you know, symphonic, symphonic or, or kind of orchestral conducting, and and there I think it's it's actually the same thing, but it's that the you know the category sphere encloses the minds and activities of the performers as well. So you consider the system that includes both the conductor and the performers, and you know I, I know that the bassoonist is going to be upset by the suggestion that she is simply an extension of the conductor, and it's, it's of course not that simple, but but there's such a visceral connection between them, and that, that's what great symphonic conductors have, and great jazz leaders, and, and, and the, the like. You know, there's an ability to communicate in a really subtle but unambiguous way with the people whose activities they're coordinating. And it's yet another version of that that we're building. And so we don't have finger extensions, we just have the hands that we already had. But no one's really given the hands a good run yet in the, in the digital realm. So we're trying to build not only the gestural language, the, the sort of human output machine input piece, uh, but build an entirely new kind of on-screen experience, feedback lifts and, and all sorts of stuff that have never had to exist before because the machine was never listening to something as sophisticated as human hands before. So that, that the complete system that includes both your mind and your hands and the machine's kind of feedback about its ongoing real-time interpretation of same, um, I think really is in the same category. You know, it's that, it's that augmented human, the augmented mind. Um, and I think that the, the advantage that we have is that we're including in the definition of augmented mind, or we're pulling into the implementation the pieces of brain that are to do with understanding space, the proprioceptive stuff, the, the muscle memory stuff. You know, that isn't typically given much rain in, in when people think about digital interfaces, but really should be. Hmm. Do you think do you think people's sort of familiarity with with using things like webcams that are now very common in, in desktop or in notebook computers, um, and the kind of the burgeoning use of those as sort of gestural controllers for things like websites? Mm -hmm. Uh, it, how much? How much do you think that has brought a kind of insistence to the public of a kind of redeveloping of a sort of point-and-click system that uses like a mouse for for navigation and things like that? You mean how much is it a harbinger? Does it matter? Does it matter? Do you the, think, or is it all, well, of all of it matters. All of it matters, and it, in one way, it starts. It starts in fiction. It starts most recently with Minority Report, so you know, even nine years later, people still reference that movie when they want to talk about futuristic technology, and particularly when they want to talk about futuristic UI technology. So that, that kind of commonly experienced, because it's a Hollywood movie after all, commonly experienced view of the future, view of how things could be, really took hold. And in the years since then, You've seen countless echoes of that in you know, HP commercials and Jay-Z music videos and a lot of other music videos besides, and a lot of other commercials besides. Um, and you've also seen it in, start to creep out into the actual world of UI development. So uh, I think it's not too far to say that the, you know, Minority Report sort of puts the stuff in the air, it floats around, and little bits of it condense, condense into the recent you know, resurgence of interest in multi-touch systems, for mm -hmm. example which people forget have been around for many decades. But, but now they're commercial, and that's no small feat, you know, taking something that's only ever been kind of a, a research entity, a research uh, you know, whim, and turning it into a, an extremely popular product, and an extremely popular meme, really, you know, an idea that this is the way that you could interface with objects.